professor Carl T. Bergstrom. It's evening for us. It's morning for Carl, who I believe is on the west coast of the US. Professor Bergstrom is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Washington. He uses mathematical models and computer simulations to study a range of problems in population biology, animal behavior, and evolutionary theory. He's currently studying how, how current norms and institutions shape scientific knowledge. Further, he examines evolutionary explanations for humans' vulnerability to disease. Finally, he also studies how living organ organisms, including humans, acquire, store, and disseminate information. Within this area, he has, current, he has recently co-authored with Jevin West a book titled Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. I can attest on when I started reading the book, I was, as a social scientist, really uh, 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 surprised by, by, by the way that actually uh, 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 Jevin and Carl connect uh, misinformation among humans, which I am rather acquainted with, with misinformation, disinformation among other animals. And it's a very thought-provoking take on, on, in part on what kind of is common to all animals, whether they walk on two legs or not. Uh, so uh, following his talk, we will hold the question and answer session, a brief one in English. The audience is invited to post questions either in English or in Hebrew in the Q&A box accessible through the on-screen Zoom menu. And I will relay those questions, time permitting, to Professor Bergstrom. Uh, so Professor Bergstrom, uh, it's a real honor for, for you to join us today and the virtual uh, podium is yours. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roy. It's a it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm just going to try to share my screen here with everybody. And uh, let's see. We'll like, give me just one second, I guess. Let's see. Um, there we go. Uh, that should work. Let's see. Okay. See. Oops. Screen sharing has failed. So let me try this again. Hang okay. on. Okay. No worries. Um, Zoom is always interesting. Let's see. Yeah. There we go. There, yeah. does that work? People Terrific. can see it now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank great, you. great. So um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the honor of uh, letting me be here to, to speak. Um, I, I think I'm here, you know, essentially because four years ago, I decided to teach a class on bullshit. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk about you know, why it's here and, and, and how it's changing and what we can do about it. Um, and it wasn't supposed to change the direction of my whole kind of research, but these sorts of unexpected things happen in, in academia. So um, let me tell you a little bit about the, about, the, about the class, about some of my thoughts about all, all of this, and, uh, and, and we'll go forward from there. So we, we, we decided uh, you know, that we spent so much of our time, uh, both individual time and our professional academic time, you know, dealing with, with, uh, with, with bullshit. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to what that is precisely for me in, in just a moment. But we thought that these skills would be something that, that our students could find very, very useful. Uh, we initially just simply put up a, a, a syllabus for this because we weren't sure that the university was going to allow us to teach a course, not so much because, uh, you know, it was on bullshit, but because we were in different colleges in the university and you know how university bureaucracies can be. But the syllabus uh, generated an enormous amount of, uh, of attention and that that was fortuitous because uh, this is Jevin West and I here, um, my, my co-author in all of this. And uh, that, that, that was fortuitous because it gave us the opportunity to, uh, you know, then go to the university and say, look, we really want to teach this. Um, we've taught this course now uh, for four years. It's generated a ton of attention. Um, and, uh, you know, to my delight, it's been picked up um, in part or in whole by universities all around the world. Um, and most recently, we've written a, a book uh, that tries to lay out this story that Roy uh, referred to um, at the start. And the, and the central thesis in all of this, and here I'm really going to be absolutely talking about what you do, not what I do. And so I beg your leniency, uh, you know, with, with the things that I get wrong um, as I go here and look forward to hearing about them in the, in the discussions. But you know, as someone you know, who's just immersed in it rather than, I mean, so this is, right, this is ichthyology by fish, not ichthyology by ichthyologist, if you will. Um, but, uh, but, but as someone who's, uh, you know, immersed in, in this uh, world, right, we're inundated with, we're inundated with information and, and so much of it, of course, is, 
is bullshit. We've got this information environment that I describe as being torrential. It's addictive. It's engineered to be addictive, right? And we feel this especially, I think, during COVID. It's unreliable. It's insincere. And everybody knows all of these things. Um, and so you, what we want to do is sort of think about, well, how did we end up here? What's it doing to us? And what can we do about it? And these are sort of the, the, you know, the focal questions in, in the book and in how we think about all of this. But to start out, I just want to you know, address this question. Well, what is bullshit in the first place? Why did we use this word? What do we, what do we mean by this in particular? Um, and this goes back really to a seminal essay that was written by Harry Frankfurt in, in 1986, where he you know, recognized bullshit as a legitimate uh, subject of philosophical inquiry. And he starts off his lovely, you know, now short book. It was originally a, a scholarly paper. Uh, this is one of the most salient features of our culture is there's so much bullshit. Everyone knows this. Each of us contributes his share, but we tend to take the situation for granted. And then Frankfurt goes on to say, well, you know, clearly we need some theory about what this stuff is. And Frankfurt lays out his own definition. Um, Jevin and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what we mean by the term. And I'll just present you with our, with our definition here. And we think that bullshit involves language, statistical figures, data graphics, and other forms of presentation that are intended to impress, overwhelm, or persuade presented with a blatant disregard for truth, logical coherence, or what information is actually being conveyed. And so it's really all about trying to create a certain impression and perhaps, um, you know, bowl the reader over with, or the, or the listener over with, with one's brilliance and such, um, without actually informing that person. So um, just to give you an example, uh, I think you know, I found this when I was reading a biography of Sigmund Freud, quite a remarkable letter that he wrote. Um, he says, so I gave my lecture yesterday. Despite a lack of preparation, I spoke quite well and without hesitation, which I ascribed to the cocaine I had taken beforehand. I told about my discoveries in brain anatomy, all very difficult things that the audience certainly didn't understand. But all that matters is they get the impression that I understand it. And that is bullshit, is intended to impress, overwhelm, or persuade, presented with a blatant disregard for what information is actually being conveyed. The cocaine is optional, the rest is bullshit. And uh, so um, I find that so much of our information environment now involves this. And and in particular, I think that, uh, you know, we, we have going through the process of, you know, just go, you know, as we, as we get used to living in an information environment that's full of bullshit, I think that we become fairly good at spotting bullshit words, right? We come, get fairly good at seeing the sort of weasel words that corporate spokespeople do to avoid responsibility or, or misleading promises from politicians or that kind of thing. But, but numbers are a lot harder. And that's really a focus of my interest of, about how people use numbers to bullshit. Numbers feel like they come straight from nature. They, they, you know, if we kind of compare words and numbers, words feel like they're sort of products of human minds, whereas, you know, numbers are, numbers are extrinsic. Words are subjective. Numbers are objective. Words are imprecise and fuzzy. Numbers are precise and crisp. Uh, words are intuitive and expressive. Numbers are logical and scientific. Words are personal and idiosyncratic to the speaker. Numbers are something that could be replicated by anyone. Words are contingent. Numbers are universal. These are the feelings that we get from words and numbers. These aren't necessarily accurate, but they, they, they add a level of rhetorical weight, if you will, to, uh, to, to numbers. And they make, it, they make numbers feel particularly credible. Numbers also feel challenging to us to question because they're often wrapped up in a bunch of technical uh, apparatus that can be fancy statistics or machine learning algorithms or anything else like that. And so they're particularly uh, unlikely to be challenged by someone who hears them. And all of this makes them very, very powerful vehicles for bullshitting where you're trying to impress or, you know, uh, or persuade by overwhelming somebody. Um, and what we see is this transition from what I'd call old school bullshit to to new school bullshit where, you know, in old school bullshit, we have statements like this. So you can imagine a corporate uh, um, mission statement it says our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. And this is bullshit because you have no idea what this company actually does. Um, but this is words and we're kind of used to seeing this sort of stuff and we know what to do with it. More and more, we're seeing this kind of thing. This is new school bullshit in numbers. Yeah. Well, sort of statistical significance after Bonferroni correction, um, P equals 
0.13, our results underscore clinically important effect size. The relative odds of survival at five years, 1.2, that challenges the current par therapeutic paradigm. So, I mean, this seems very uh, uh, quantified. It seems, you know, uh, objective, et cetera. Um, and yet, you know, when you read something like this, you can ask yourself questions about, well, you know, like, okay, so, so you, know, you know, first of all, what is a Bonferroni correction? Why do they do it? Why are they presenting this to me when they don't have statistical significance? What does it mean to, um, to, under, to have an important effect size if it's not statistically significant? Um, you know, how can you know, non-significant results challenge a parent, et cetera, et cetera? So, I mean, I think what we want to try to help our students think about and what we think, you know, we need to help people in the world in general think about is about bullshit that comes in this form. And the sort of general uh, framework that we present to our students uh, is, is what we call a, a black box framework where we, you kind of, when you think about, uh, because it's to try to deal with the fact that, you know, you, when you see a claim like that, uh, it, it's intimidating. You don't remember what all the procedures are. You don't remember how to do a, um, you know, multivariate logistic regression or, or what, exactly what a random forest algorithm does or whatever. But in general, you tend to have this framework where you have a set of data and the data um, are collected. They are put into uh, statistical procedures, algorithms, whatever it may be. Um, and, uh, and, and these then are used to generate some output, some kind of quantitative output, uh, which people look at and then, and then provide an interpretation. And the key thing that we try to teach all of our students, whether they're in STEM or not in STEM, is, is and I think it's kind of a key logical tool for all of us, is that even if you don't know how the algorithms work, you can almost always spot the bullshit by carefully looking at what in it goes in and what goes out, because the bullshit is almost never in the black box. The black box is the intimidating part that you feel like you can't unpack because you don't know how the, the, the things work or you once knew and you've forgotten or whatever. But all, very, very few of the misleading data-driven statements that are made are, are the results of artifacts in the in the actual analytical process. And they're almost always because the data that goes in are not representative or are flawed in some way, or because people take the output and draw um, inappropriate interpretations or conclusions from that. And so we frame this entire course around this sort of approach. Um, so that's that's kind of you know uh, what we've been trying to do with with teaching uh, students how to think about all of this. But as we th as we you know to get back to these these questions that I was asking um, before, you know how do we end up here? What's it doing to us? And and what can we do about it? I want to go way back to the beginning of time. You know, long before uh, there were anything like humans, and think about the way that misleading information came into the world in the first place. And you know, when you think about communication, communication is extremely powerful because what it does is it gives you a handle on someone else's behavior. Instead of having to physically take someone and, and, and physically force them to do something, I can, I can issue some statement, I can communicate in some way, be it with feathers or with, or with, with a call or with words, um, and get them to voluntarily do those things. Now, that can be extremely powerful as a way of coordinating action across across individuals, um, but it also does, you know, create a level of vulnerability where one individual can get another to act in its, in its service, if you will. And so, um, you know, of course, as soon as you start to see communication in the animal world, you start to see deception arising as well. I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's start with these guys. These are, these amazingly cute things are not, you know, the latest Pixar uh, cre uh, creation, but rather these are stomatopod shrimp. Um, or stomatopods, they're, uh, they're sometimes called mantis shrimp. They're remarkable, remarkable animals. Um, they, uh, they're, they're, what, what they do is they, they live on the reef and they crack uh, shells with, with, their, with their claws, with this amazingly powerful punch. Um, it's one of the most rapid accelerations created in nature. There's sort of a spring-loaded mechanism that allows them to, to punch so fast that they actually generate a, what's known as a cavitation bubble. They punch through the water um, and, and actually uh, you know, create this like, vacuum in the water that causes a literal bang and a flash of light. And so it's like, a, it's like you know, when Batman used to punch, he would say kapow, and you'd see this. And there's a, these guys have like a literal kapow. They're a pain to keep in aquaria because they punch right through the wall the glass walls of the aquarium. Um, 
And uh, and so these guys are, you really don't want to get in a boxing match with, with one of these things. And, and, and they're aware of that because on the reef where they live, there are a very small number of crevices that are appropriate for them to hide out. They need places to hide on the reef because everything eats everything on the reef. And, and, um, and so these crevices are in very high demand and they fight over them. And uh, so typically when one, when one comes up to, the, to another, um, it, it, there's one that's hiding in the reef and one comes up to the one that's hiding in the reef. And, uh, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll wave these big claws around um, as a way of sort of sizing each other up, right? And this waving thing, you know, if there's a, you know, if, if, if you have a big strong one and it'll wave its claw and it says, hey, look, I'm willing to get in a fight, I'll punch you if you try to take my hole. And then the other one kind of looks at that and decides whether to leave or whether to, or, or whether to try to, you know, still uh, push it, push the one away. And, and often if the one in the hole is small and the one attacking it is big, um, then the one in the hole will take off and, and, and swim away through the reef and, and turn over the hole to the, to the attacker. Um, and that's what happens most of the time. But these are crustaceans, they're growing constantly. And so they have to molt. And so every month or so, they have to shed their entire exoskeleton. And during that time, they're basically like the soft inside of a lobster tail. They're defenseless. The claws can't punch powerfully. Um, they can't fight each other, but they're also at super high risk on the reef because they don't have their armor. And what happens then is, uh, is this very interesting uh, deceptive maneuver. So, so a bantus shrimp that is molting can't fight at all. And yet even, you know, big, small, whatever, when that mantis shrimp um, is confronted, if it's in a hole in the reef, it will bluff and pretend that it's a big, strong mantis shrimp and it'll make the same arm waving display that it would make if it was, you know, the strongest, toughest mantis shrimp with no, with no molt. And uh, so we see this as, as, you know, this feels like a, like a form of deception. If you have a, if you have a, or a bluffing or something like this, if you have sort of a scale of fighting ability from good, you've got good fighters and medium fighters, and then you've got molting ones that can't fight at all. Well, the medium ones don't threaten when they're encountered. They just, they just leave. The, the good ones um, and the molting ones do this threatening display. And so this feels very deceptive, um, especially if you think about the, um, the signal as a signal of fighting ability. Of course, the thing to recognize is that this is a layer of meaning that we're imposing on top of what these guys are saying. So, um, and if it, you know, feel it, we're saying, oh, this must be a signal of like how well they can fight. But notice that we could we could view this in a different way. We could think of it as the willingness to risk a fight. Um, and if you think of it as the willingness to risk a fight, now you have. Um, a different story. So the good ones are willing to risk, the ones that are in good condition are willing to risk a fight because they'll win. The ones that are molting are willing to risk a fight because it's sort of a death sentence to be molting and go out on the reef. And the medium ones are not willing to risk a fight. And so, um, you know, if we look at it in that perspective, we could say, well, maybe this isn't really so dishonest after all. Just kind of, I bring this up, you know, um, just to sort of illustrate the complexity of trying to actually ascribe meanings to, to animal signals. Um, so that's one example. Um, I want to give another example that's sort of from my, you know, my favorite creature on the on the planet. This is a, this is a, this is a raven. Um, ravens are masters of deception, and uh, and and in particular, what ravens do. Well, here I'll tell you a little bit of what they do, and then we can look at the study. So what what you know one of one of the many things that ravens do that's that's deceptive is uh, is they cache their food. So when they get a good, you know, ravens typically feed on large food items, you know, a large carcass or something like that. They can't eat all of it at once. And so they take pieces of the food and they go and they cache it, store it away. And uh, then, you know, we'll, we'll come back to it later on when they have more time. Um, the problem is, is they also watch each other as they do this. And so if I cache my food and, uh, and Roy's watching, then he could come take it later. And so I need to try to prevent that from happening. And so they do something called fake caching. They have a big throat pouch and they store the food in the throat pouch and they go, and if they're being watched, they'll go pretend to cache something. They'll go pretend to, you know, to take, drop it out of their beak and put it into a, a caching spot. And they'll, you know, pick up leaves or moss and tuck that over it and do the entire process, but they haven't actually deposited the food. And so that's, that's this fake caching behavior. And they'll go around and do this uh, to try to keep each other guessing. And the re remarkable, and so that's already a pretty neat level of deception, but the remarkable level of deception is how they figure out when they actually need to, to do this uh, fake caching. And there's a lovely experiment that was done recently that, that illustrates sort of a theory of mind um, on the part of ravens that surpasses basically all non-human primates. 
And the study, I'll just show you, tell you what the study does, and then we can talk a little bit about what it says. But what they did in the study is they, uh, they, they take one bird and they put that bird in a little box. And it, that box has an open window. Uh, where they, it can look out through the open window. And then they have a bird out in the larger enclosure. They give that bird a treat. Here's some you know, pieces of steak. And, um, and the bird out in the, in the uh, larger enclosure knows that it's being watched through the window and it fake caches a number of times so that, the, so that the bird in the box doesn't know where the food actually is. If you then slide the window um, to the box closed, uh, then the bird uh, out there doesn't fake cash. It just uh, takes its food, caches it right away. It's, it knows it's not being watched. And so, you know, one way we could interpret this is that, uh, well, the the you know the the bird out in the larger enclosure, um, you know, knows what the other bird is seeing, kind of thinks through what it's thinking, and and decides, oh, I need to fool it. Um, but we don't need such a complicated mechanism to uh, to to explain a, a fake caching behavior. Uh, given what we've seen so far, I mean, you could have a very simple rule. If you see another raven, fake cash. If you don't, don't. And that doesn't require a theory of mind. So how do you show that the bird actually has some kind of theory of mind? And it's with a really clever experiment. What they did um, is, in addition to having the big open window, they put a little peephole in the box. And so the birds uh, have experience with being in the box and outside of the box. So the bird that's caching the food has also been in the box and had experience looking through the box and so on. And what they found is that if you open up the peephole, whether or not there's a raven in there, um, you know, the bird that's outside can't tell whether there's a raven actually in the box, but there might be a raven in the box. And if you open up the peephole, um, then that raven that might be in the box uh, would be able to see you. Uh, as you go through your caching. And so they found that if they open up the peephole, that's enough to get the, the there doesn't have to be a bird in there. Just open up the peephole. That's enough to get the raven out in the larger enclosure to fake cache. And the only way that we can think to explain this is that the bird in on the outer enclosure understands that there could be a bird in the box and understands that that bird would be seeing, uh, you know, if there were a bird there, it would be seeing what was going on. And so here we actually have a situation where, where we're, you know, where we have a bird that's, you know, using fundamentally a uh, theory of mind. It is, a it is imagining what a bird that might even be, might not even be there would think, um, which, which has an enormous parallel, by the way, to, to our use of social media, right? It's like when we, when we post something on Twitter or on Facebook or, or Instagram, I mean, we're putting ourselves in the minds of people that might not even be listening, might not even be out there and trying to create certain impressions, right? And so this is really like a key thing about, you know, in sort of moving toward uh, more sophisticated bullshit. If you're trying to manipulate somebody, you need to be able to put yourself in the place of your mark and be able to think through what they might be thinking. And, and Ravens clearly have that. Humans have something else. Humans have combinatorial communication um, that allows us to say an infinitely expand, you know, sort of an infinite expanse of different things. You know, the, the signaling systems that uh, most animals have are, are limited. They're you know, a relatively small number of things they can say, but we can of course create uh, brand new sentences and all of that with our, with our language systems. And that allows us to bullshit people in ways they've never been bullshit before. And so we, so you can, you can, um, you know, we, we, we can constantly have this sort of, you know, running arms race where people are trying new ways to confuse and so on. And so I think there's sort of, you know, we start off that paper that we wrote uh, actually long before we worked on bullshit that we wrote 16 years ago or something um, with this Martin Buber uh, thing. The lie is the specific evil which man has introduced into nature. So, you know, as, as good as, as good of deceivers are as animals, as animals are, I think we're different. All of our deeds of violence and our misdeeds are only, as it were, a highly bred development of what this and that creature nature is able to achieve in its own way. But the lie is our very own invention, different in kind from every deceit that the animals can produce. And I think because of the, the fact that we can use combinatorial communication to constantly lie in new ways that have never been lied before, we do have a different sort of level of deception um, than we've seen anywhere else. And that, you know, especially through the expansion of social media and stuff has sucked us down into this vortex where we are now, where we've got this, uh, you know, information environment that is, that is so difficult to navigate and is so insincere and misleading and, and so on. Um, so, um, so let me, you know, run through some of these questions clearly. And this is where I'm treading most, most, uh, you know, uh, 
badly on 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 your turf. So uh, if all of this is wrong, I look forward to hearing how. But this is this is how I see it as an outsider, and I'm really influenced by um, by work that's been done in biology again in all of this about the way that uh, developments uh, in information technology and biology change the way that uh, um, that change the sort of possibility space of what organisms can do. Uh, but but in any case, um, let me take you through a little bit of this. So I mean, you can sort of, and so, so what do I mean by this, right? The medium we use influences what we say and how the message spreads. And as, as media evolve, um, it's possible to, to actually communicate about new kinds of things. So if we think back to sort of a, a pre-literate society where you have simply an oral tradition, there's certain kinds of information that you simply don't expect to to communicate about. And one of the most important, I think, of those is, is like numerical records. So when you start to look at some of the first, um, you know, written uh, documents, you look at Sumerian tablets or something like this, you see a lot of uh, numerical tables like this. I believe this is a tax ledger here. And that's something, you know, so you can, you can store a myth, uh, you can store an epic poem in, 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 in an oral tradition, but uh, much, much harder to store like a tax record in oral tradition. And then, you know, I, I, I tell Jevin, you know, oh yeah, you know, um, remember we had this song about how you owe me all this money. And, and he says, no, 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 the song was about how I owe you a 10th of that much money. And, and we, we, we don't agree, but if it's stamped in, if it's stamped in clay, it's, you, you can say different kinds of things, you know, both in terms of the veracity of it, but also in, in, in the sort of permanence of it, but also just in terms of like, can you imagine, you know, having, having songs of, <laughs> long tax tables and stuff like that. It just doesn't, doesn't work. So, so as you develop, you know, written writing, you can communicate about, about new things. Of course, on tablets, you know, there's, there's, there's limited, they take up enormous amounts of space. And so then you can, you can switch to papyrus and to paper, and then you can generate these kinds of, you know, remarkable, uh, you know, libraries where you can fit so much more information into a, into a limited amount of space. And that allows you to uh, write about many more things. And so you can store more, uh, you know, greater wealth of knowledge um, in, in a limited space. And so, so, so sort of the, the, the total amount of, you know, stored human knowledge in, in written form expands dramatically as because of that shift in information technology. But, you know, when you're still having to write out things by hand like this, you have to, you know, who can commission a book? You have to be, you know, either a member of the clergy or the nobles to have the wealth to be able to commission a handwritten book like this. And so there's a very tight filter on who gets to decide what's written and what's written about and what's written down and, and so on. And so of course, then the, the printing press radically changes this because anyone can, can now, uh, you know, print this. And, and there's a lot of anxiety about this at the time, right? So here's uh, the scribe Filippo de Strada. It says, writing indeed, which brings in gold for us, should be respected and held to be nobler than all goods, unless she has suffered degradation in the, bro in the brothel of the printing presses. So, um, you know, this is, uh, uh, he seems to be concerned about the, about the, you know, about the purity of, of the written word. I think he's probably more concerned about job security. This is a man who uh, makes a living by, by writing illuminated manuscripts. But, um, but in any case, you know, there was, there was that grave concern there. Um, and then when you have the printing press, obviously, uh, you know, now, now uh, common people can write things and common people can also, to some degree, own books. Uh, which is another major change. You also can get this sort of acceleration of the pace of, of, of information transmission because you can print a lot very fast. And so we see, you know, the rise of the golden age of the newspaper and so on where, uh, you know, the, the, where we get the first sort of advent of the news cycle. These are brilliant innovation um, in, uh, in, in information technology is the notion of the lending library. Um, and the, uh, you know, just the, just the invention of the idea that, uh, that, you know, you don't have to own a book to be able to read it and to be able to basically take all the world's knowledge and put that in a place where people can go, uh, common people can go and see that as, you know, again, radically changing sort of the, the structure of information. Um, and then we kind of move closer to the present day. And here's a, here's a quote from uh, sociologist Neil Postman. And he says, well, yeah, this isn't all good. Uh, the invention of new and various kinds of communication has given a voice and an audience to many people whose opinions would otherwise not be solicited and who, in fact, have little else but verbal excrement to co contribute to the public issues. And so this sounds like exactly like a perfect description of social media. Um, and Neil Postman wrote this in 1969. He's not talking about social media at all. He's talking about, uh, you know, the rise of television simply for the sake of entertainment, um, you know, trash magazines and 
all of that sort of thing. Um, and so at this point, you know, he's already, this is, you know, every generation complains about this stuff. And this is something we have to remember. In any case, we do get this, you know, next innovation where it occurs to people, hey, let's take all the compute, you know, let's start linking computers together and letting them share information. So this is MTS. It's an early predecessor of an internet-like system developed in Michigan. Um, and this, of course, radically changes things as well. When you get to the point where you're linking all these computers together, and then you bring online things like digital typesetting, um, you know, as well as the uh, World Wide Web and, and powerful search engines, then everyone can become a information producer at very, very low costs. You take away the usual gatekeepers uh, that, that had been there all along in terms of, uh, you know, uh, requiring a certain amount of social and, and uh, economic capital in order to produce content for other people to read. Um, and so, you know, now you can, the, the promise, I remember being so excited about this in the very early 1990s is this is going to democratize, democratize the worldwide conversation and bring all of these unheard voices online. And, and there is some truth to that. Um, but what it also did is it also undermined the role or undercut the role uh, that editors and producers and things were playing. And so we had this enormous volume of material that's out there and, uh, and, and no one to help us sort through it. Um, and so we came upon a solution um, of social media where we all play the roles of editors for one another. Um, and so in, not only am I a content producer, but I am a content moderator. What I read is now determined not by a professional editor at the New York Times or a professional producer at uh, public broadcasting. It's determined by my uncle Rick, who has some very strange views about, um, you know, whatever it is, right? And so that's that's what uh, social media has has wrought. And of course, this is exploding. You know, the average time used on social media, these are U.S. figures going up dramatically. Um, in the U.S., uh, people get a ton of their news from social media. Um, uh, so it's becoming, you know, more people are getting their news from social media than print in the United States these days. Uh, uh, television news is still larger, um, but but social media is catching up rapidly. And the problem with all of this is that we're playing the roles of editors and we're terrible editors. And that's you know sort of the really dangerous part of this. We're terrible editors partly because we're not trained. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have the sort of reputational stakes involved that would be there for editors. And partly because when we're sharing things on social media, we're doing it for quite different reasons than um, than, than editors are doing uh, for the most part when they're choosing what to publish in a magazine. And, and Judith Donath at MIT uh, points this out, you know, and, and the idea is that on social media, when you share something, you're not just sharing it to inform or persuade, you're sharing it as a marker of identity. You're sharing it to, to proclaim your affinity with a community. And so the idea is if I go on social media and post something like this, you know, here's Trump, it says, demand Obama's records, won't release his own, right? Um, well, everybody knows that. Everyone knows he did that. Well, I'm not putting that to communicate anything new to anybody, right? What I'm doing is I'm actually signaling my own identity. I'm saying, hey, me, I'm, I'm with you, Biden-Harris supporters. But the thing is, in order to do that job of communicating that message of, of my own affiliations, what I'm saying doesn't have to be true. And in fact, the stupider it is, the more effective it is in some ways. So I could say something like, you know, huge cover up, um, you know, secret FBI files show Hillary funded migrant caravan with laundered drug money or something like this, right? It's, it's, it's absurd. Um, but it doesn't matter that it's absurd because you know, the more implausible, the stronger the signal that I'm saying, me, I'm with you, you know, the people that are supporting Trump and, and, are, and are willing to, you know, believe evil of the other side, no matter what they've done. And so this is, um, you know, this gives this sort of incentive for people to, to share uh, misleading information, but more generally, just to be simply unconcerned with the truth of what it is that, that they're, that they're sharing. You know, all of this is, of course, exacerbated by uh, you know many, many changes in the in the in the in the um, in the sort of economic models around publication, right? So when you have subscription-driven publications and you're thinking about uh, you know uh, what to read, you're kind of thinking about this sort of long-term relationship with a newspaper, if you will, and you're going to you're saying, where am I going to put down? What what is it that I want to read over the over the next year? And you can kind of you know you're you're sort of you know better. Um, you can let the better parts of your nature decide what's going to provide you with the most informative analysis. Um, when I get up in the morning and I look on my iPhone, 
um, at the news. And then I see, you know, a set of these articles here and, and now they're all competing head to head from different outlets, right? Uh, and, and so, um, you know, now they're just trying to appeal for those clicks. And so instead, you know, instead of running to read some kind of, you know, detailed tax analysis, I'm going to, I'm going to subscribe, you know, I'm going to just get pulled in by whatever seems most appealing and at the time. And I'll end up, you know, clicking on what percent introvert and extrovert are you by swiping on these office characters on Tinder or something stupid like that. And so this head to head competition, um, you know, creates this whole set of problems, you know, so here we get, you know, you've got these sort of, you know, possibly interesting stories on the eve of the midterms, Republicans make their final pitches, but this can't, com this can't compete with, you know, the question about whether someone got a bigger butt and 17 cats that are so beautiful that they could be supermodels, right? So, um, you know, we we have this sort of race to the bottom because of the nature of the of the economic technology that's causing this head to head competition between individual articles across platforms. And with that, we see headlines even doing the same sort of thing. This is the sort of rise of of uh, of you know uh, forward reference headlines where you have uh, where you have a headline that goes out of its way not to tell you what the story says. And we first saw this in places like BuzzFeed and and the likes. But now this is taking place in all the mainstream media outlets. So you know one fifth of this occupation has a serious drinking problem. So they've kind of worded around. They're using this pronoun to uh, with a referent that's on down in the you know that's in the story to make you click because that's where the money is. Um, and there was never any reason to do this when you had you know how to evade the leading cause of the United States. Donald Trump has has one has discovered this one weird trick for getting people to agree with him. And I don't want to leave anyone hanging. So it's lawyers don't get in an accident, and he takes both sides of every issue. Okay, so um, the bottom line is that in the communication medium right now, the unvarnished truth is no longer good enough. It does not drive clicks the way it used to. And so we see this in the sort of, you know, what is what kinds of uh, phrases are successful on Facebook, looking at 100 million articles, and looking at the ones that, that get the most engagement. The phrases that are successful on Facebook are, are don't just tell you facts, they promise you experiences. Number one phrase will make you. Um, and then, uh, you know, tears of joy, make you cry, give you goosebumps, shock to see, melt your heart. Uh, communication has become, you know, all about this, you know, engagement and also about bringing you into the story, right? And so, you know, more and more of the stories, and I don't think I go into this in a lot of detail here, but more and more of the stories are all about, uh, you know, instead of being like, uh, you know, uh, FBI does this investigation, it'll say, uh, Twitter users are freaking out uh, because the FBI is doing this investigation. And then all of a sudden the story is about you because you're one of the, what people on Facebook are saying about. And so it's, so again, using all of these tricks to bring you in to engagement while diluting down the power of the message. And this is really, I think, a consequence of the, of the uh, fundamental economic technology that's being used to monetize uh, this, this kind of information. Um, let's see. So what's it doing to us? Um, I think we can see what it's doing to us really strongly with uh, what's happened in the COVID pandemic. And I can just, you know, look at some of the things that that, that have happened with COVID. COVID's really hard because we began with complete scientific uncertainty. We had this virus that was never in humans before December 2019. And so we've got all this scientific uncertainty, but into that uncertainty vacuum, we have all, we have di organized disinformation campaigns flowing, right? All these, uh, you know, uh, organized, uh, you know, presumably often state level uh, kinds of disinformation and propaganda trying to scare up, um, you're trying to scare people or, or reverse, uh, you know, make people think that, it, that the whole thing is a hoax. Um, we get disingenuous government messaging, right? We have, uh, have the government standing up and lying about what's going on and, and worse yet, often telling, saying two different things at the same time. So on the same day that, uh, that Trump was uh, saying, you know, there are only 15 people had it and it was going to go away. And, and Larry Kudlow was saying, we've contained the virus. Um, the CDC was saying, this is going to be a huge outbreak and it's going to be an enormous problem. Um, we have uh, people that are, you know, decide that they, you know, Dunning-Kruger effect 19. So these are people that decide, well, I'm good at analyzing data. So I, you know, epide how hard can epidemiology be? And then they, you know, put out their own analyses. You have a lot of fake studies in astroturfing. Um, just like we've seen with, uh, you know, in, in other areas with, you know, in conservation and in, uh, and in tobacco and things like that. Um, you know, the, in the, you have all these dreadful preprints being published that are, that are, you know, completely irresponsible. One of the most uh, viewed papers ever on social media was withdrawn in two days. It was a paper that claimed that it, uh, 
Um, it was, this had not been through peer review. It was posted. It claimed that there were big chunks of the HIV genome in, in the COVID genome, and, uh, and therefore it was a bioweapon. This was completely false. Um, but despite the fact that it was completely false, and despite the fact that the authors withdrew it in two days, you know, it, it exploded across the internet. The peer-reviewed work is just as bad. On the left, we, left we have a peer-reviewed paper that claims that uh, 5G actually causes uh, coronavirus to uh, self-assemble within the cells. The paper on the right, we have a much more serious paper that was much more dangerous, um, which was the paper that uh, that was, I, I'm suddenly blanking on whether it was in, uh, in JAMA or what, but it was one of the really high profile uh, medical journals that claimed that claim to find deleterious effects of, uh, of hydrochloroquine. As a result of that paper, the hydrochloroquine, a number of hydrochloroquine trials were canceled. Turned out the, in, that the data were entirely manufactured out of thin air and, were, and it was a fraud. Um, we see bad reporting. I won't go into that. We see cherry picked data, just an excuse to get some ravens in. Um, we see organized agnatogenesis, um, the, the sort of you know, deliberate campaigns to create uncertainty around uh, scientific facts that we've seen. Robert Proctor's written about this a lot. We've seen this with uh, big tobacco. We've seen it with big oil. Uh, now we're seeing it around uh, around COVID as well. Um, the idea is not to tell people that, uh, you know, that the gun's not smoking. The idea is just to give them other reasons why there might be smoke there. And uh, so you're not trying to, you're not trying to prove that, uh, smoking doesn't cause cancer. You're just trying to create enough doubt that regulatory bodies won't act, right? Um, and all of this leads inadvertently or you know, on purpose or, or not on purpose to uh, something that looks very much like this falsehood fire hose strategy of propaganda. Here's, here's Gary Kasparov summarizing. The point of modern propaganda isn't to just to misinform or make you believe the wrong things. It's to annihilate your truth, right? It's to exhaust critical thinking. It's to put out so many different mutually contradictory stories that you throw up your hands and say, God, I don't know what to think. I, I give up. And, you know, whether we like it or not, that's what our modern media environment has done to us around COVID. Um, even professionals have a very hard time figuring out what's going on and, and, and it's nearly impossible for, for lay people. Um, what can we do about it? And I'll, I'll conclude with this, with this section. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of approaches, right? Technology is one approach. Uh, you know, if you can if you can keep a straight face while saying that you're going to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to to detect fake news, you can you can get venture capital money in Silicon Valley right now. Um, I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, those are very very hard problems, and uh, the power of uh, of um, adversarial machine learning. So you can set up a machine learning algorithm to that can learn how to beat the algorithms that that use machine learning to find fake news. I don't think that you know ultimately technology is going to be very successful. I mean, I could give a whole talk on each of these, but I'm just putting these ideas up. You know, there's notions of regulation, right? We could try to make fake news illegal. We could, um, we could. Uh, I think you know there are places where we can ask for greater transparency on the part of uh, you know social media companies, where we can ask for greater user control, that kind of thing. But overall, I don't think we can really regulate our way out of this mess. Um, you know, coming from the United States, I have this very strong allegiance to First Amendment principles, and so I don't want to see speech criminalized, uh, mainly because I don't trust uh, the person who gets to decide whether something is, say, fake news or not, right? If fake news becomes illegal and we have a president who thinks that anything he doesn't like is fake news, that creates a real problem. And so I'd rather just say, okay, fine, anyone can say anything, um, you know, short of, uh, you know, call, shouting fire in a crowded theater. So I think regulation, while we can make some gains on the margins isn't going to be the solution. And where, so where I've put my chips, if you will, is on education. And I think we can teach people how to navigate this changing media environment, just as we have over and over and over again through that whole series of examples that I talked about before. You know, people thought that, uh, that with the advent of written, of, 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 uh, of the printing press, you know, now it was going to be impossible for anyone to learn or understand anything. There are these long, you know, diatribes about how scholars won't be able to do scholarship anymore because there's going to be too much out there, and and anyone can can print lies, you know, on on a printing press, and and we we found our way around that by and large. And you can just only imagine what people must have thought, you know, in the newfangled world when people invented writing, and you know, you can imagine the complaints that uh, that the poets and and uh, um, and such would have had at the at the at the time. Um, so education, I mean, I think we've got to teach our students, and this is really where I've focused, is on this 
new school bullshit on numbers, on the role that numbers play to mislead. And we've got to teach our students to question them. And I think we're not doing a great job of that. We, you know, when we teach uh, science, technology, um, engineering, mathematics students, uh, we teach them to be very good at the me mechanics of doing things. So they can, they can, you know, invert a matrix, they can write code, they can, you know, run a gel, do all these kinds of things. But we don't, do a good job of teaching them to think critically the way that people do in the humanities and the social sciences, because we just never teach them to bang ideas up against each other and to grapple with, with challenging, conflicting ideas and to figure out how to do all of that kind of stuff. And, and you know, we're, I think, you know, fundamentally failing our students in, the, um, in, in STEM education in that way. And so that's really what we're trying to do with our course, right? So we've laid out this syllabus. We're trying to teach the students who are coming from STEM to actually think like someone in the philosophy department. We're trying to teach the students coming from the art department or the philosophy department or politics department that they can they don't have to know what's in the black box in order to see through the the bs um you know we put up these case studies the entire first version of the course is out there in these little five minute videos and we so we teach them a whole bunch of topics um you know we talk about the sort of disinformation landscape um then we teach them this, this some very basic sort of you know critical thinking skills particularly that involve numbers you know, how do you think about correlation and causation and selection bias and and data viz and machine learning and, and how does science work and then how do you go about refuting things so just to give you you know to end with just a couple of little um examples here um you know, from again, just drawing from recent things. I mean, there's a million. One thing about working on bullshit is you're never short of, uh, you're sort of never short of of study material, right? Um, it's not like working on asteroids or something. Um, so, uh, so here's a recent, you know, paper trying teach, teaching our students about uh, um, about thinking about causality and such. Um, uh, so, uh, so um, you know, bald men are at higher risk of severe coronavirus symptoms. And this paper goes through this whole mathematical, you know, not mathematical, goes through this whole, you know, complex biological explanation about endocrine systems and has all these fancy pathways and, and genetic variations and so on. And then of course, Forbes that ran this story had to issue this correction. Updated, this piece has been clarified to note that the study did not control for age, which is a risk factor for hair loss and severe COVID-19. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is really basic stuff, but it, but it, but it fooled Forbes. Um, we teach them about Goodert's law. This is, you know, the, the way that, that numbers, that quantitative targets um, can bias behavior, right? So when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. That's Marilyn Strathern's rephrasing of Goodert's law. Um, so that people, you know, when you, when you, when you uh, test students, people teach to the test and then you can, then the test is no longer a good measure. Um, then there's Campbell's law related idea, which I rephrase as when a measure becomes a target, people do stupid things. So, you know, worse than just becoming the measure being not good, it actually incentivizes bad behavior. We've seen that in the US, um, you know, Trump has seen testing, COVID testing as a sort of a report card on the success of his administration um, in, uh, in fighting COVID. And uh, so he has sought repeatedly throughout the you know, last nine months to undermine testing efforts in the United States, whether you know, saying it publicly or meddling with, uh, with CDC and other agencies repeatedly in this way. Of course, testing is not only um, a report card on how you're doing, but it's an absolutely critical component of your public health infrastructure that you need to fight these things. And it's really hurt us. And it's you know, unimaginable to my colleagues and I that we're now, uh, um, you know, we're now uh, you know, 10 months in and we still don't have tests in the United States. Um, so this is the sort of Campbell's law sort of thing. We tell people about uh, selection bias. These dentists uh, uh, thought that masks were causing all kinds of uh, tooth damage and, uh, and, and you know, gum damage because um, before the pandemic, they were seeing kind of a wide range of patients. Um, and then once the pandemic started, the only patients that they were seeing anymore had really severe uh, tooth and gum damage. And they said, well, it must be because of the masks that everyone's wearing. No, it's because who the hell goes to the dentist in the middle of a pandemic? Um, you don't go to get your teeth cleaned. You go because you've got you know, severe tooth pain, you've got bad gum damage, and they didn't account for that, right? Um, but you know, here we go. Uh, so we teach our students to sort of think through that. Again, you know, they, they did a little stat analysis, but the, but the BS isn't in the stat analysis. It's in thinking that the sample of people that they're seeing during the middle of a pandemic in New York City is the same, you know, and this was in March or April, is the same as the people they were seeing in January. And it, of course, completely isn't. We talk a lot about how to think about, I don't mean to be beating up on Trump here. This is, this is an accident. It's just, we've, this, these are coronavirus examples. Um, and I guess there's been a lot of, a lot of that lately. Um, so the, um, 
the uh, in fact, we try very hard in the course to, to hit both sides um, because we want to make sure that everybody feels that this is these are important skills that, that, that they can use. I think everyone's better off. Um, but we teach our students a lot about data visualization. So here's a, here's a very impressive looking graph that, uh, that Trump put up about testing. And you can see the number of tests are taking off. What it's not labeled here is this is the cumulative number of tests that have been, that have been run each day. And so, um, in fact, what this is actually saying is that we've completely failed to increase our testing capacity. Um, but it really looks nice. Um, you know, here's a graph that says, oh, hey, look, uh, it's trying to make the claim that, you know, that coronavirus is more dangerous for people from 20 to 44 than, than, uh, than most people think. And you can see, wow, they're hospitalized almost as much. Then you look at the bin sizes. And uh, so you've got a 25 year bin. So, you know, of course, it's, uh, you, you know, you have more people in your 25 year bin than in your 10 year bins. Um, so teaching students to see this kind of stuff. Here's a, you know, graph that I think it was just, you know, bad data design as opposed to malice, but this came out from the state of Georgia. Um, you know, this is showing over time um, from July 2nd to July 17th in that second wave in the United States, uh, the number of cases. And you think, wow, it doesn't look like things are getting much worse, but then you look and they've completely changed the scale moving from one act, from one map to another. And so actually things have gotten a lot worse in Georgia, but it doesn't show up on the maps, right? Um, so, and then, um, and then we teach them to, you know, think about some of the ways that machine learning and the likes are 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 misused. So this is an example. These guys set out to, um, you know, reinvent phrenology, if you will, and and use machine learning to tell whether or not you're a criminal from the shape of your face. And they thought they got very good at it, and they thought they had a machine that could tell whether or not you were a criminal. Well, it turns out that they had invented a smile detector because they used, uh, they used government uh, photos for the criminals on the top who are frowning, and they used LinkedIn pictures of people who are smiling um, uh, for the non-criminals. And so the algorithm learned to detect smiles, um, but they published that they detected criminals. And so, you know, this is again coming back. You don't have to understand anything about how that algorithm works. You can just think about the data that got put in the output that comes out and you can see that this kind of stuff is misleading. And that's really the core message. So ultimately we try to teach our students how to be good digital citizens. I mean, kind of a, a core rule for us, right? Uh, as, as members of the social media world is we need to think more and share less. Um, and we tell people to remember Postman's third law. Neil Postman uh, you know, was the first person to write a published essay about bullshit and his third law. Um, in the 60s, it was radical at the time. Is you know, at any given time, the chief short source of bullshit with which you have to contend is yourself. And so we teach them to um, try to get better, just as I do, at uh, at spotting those things. So that's what I had to say to you. I hope that was somewhat useful. Um, thank you very, very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. Carl, thanks so much for this stimulating, interesting, wide-ranging uh, talk. And uh, uh, just as a, a teacher of some topics that are related to these, I've collected so many interesting examples I'm going to be using in my class. A oh, wonderful. Classroom, so that's really, really great. And uh, But for the first real question, I'd like to turn it over to Nancy uh, Shechtoporat. Mm -hmm. Uh, doctoral student in our program. And uh, Nancy, uh, the floor is yours for our first question. I think you're muted, Nancy. Yeah, uh, unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this fascinating lecture on bullshit, it was great. Um, thank also, you. so many examples. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to think of 45 again without thinking about a multi, a molting madness, uh, mantis shrimp. Absolutely right. So I understand that education is, is a solution. I mean, clearly mm -hmm. that that is the bottom line and one that intuitively, of course, we all agree on. Um, you're in a very interesting place right now, especially that you have this class that you've been giving over the years, I understand. Mm -hmm. And it'd be fascinating. Have you done any long-term studies about these? It, because they're also in your university for four years, I assume. Mm -hmm. Any long-term studies of taking a, looking at these a students down the line and comparing them to others? I mean, No, just, we really it, need to do this. To and do uh, you know, this is a great question. I, I need to figure out how to do assessment on this and, and not only short-term, but long-term. It's hard enough to figure out how to write 
tests in a class on bullshit. Um, it was particularly hard to figure out how to do it this year when, when, when we had to do it in ways that they could use Google and everything else. But we had a good time doing that actually and it made our testing a lot better. Um, but in, but yeah, so so no, the the assessment is something we have to figure out. I think you're right. You want to do um, you want to be testing sort of um, you know over time as you know as the students go forward in the university. Um, and and you know so what what Jevin and I really hope is that this course would be a class that students could take you know in their first year when they come. And then they could sort of make a pain of themselves for the rest of the time that they're there by, you know, by thinking this way and in their classes and asking asking these questions and and so on. Um, and I think we're moving toward being able to do that. The we, one thing that sort of cursed us early on was the class was very very popular, and so it <laughs> so it fills up at. Uh, it you know it, it fills up. Um, it's it's not as bad now, but it was filling. It's 160 students, and it and wow. it was it was filling up in under a minute at midnight to the graduating seniors um, who have registration priority. So that was making it hard. But as we're starting to you know f meet the demand, and, and then we can bring um, and we can bring uh, freshmen into the class, then that gives us a population that we can track going forward. The other thing that's going to be really useful is uh, Jevin has. Uh, uh, put together a data science minor uh, on the campus. And so this is one of the core classes for the data science minor. And so mm -hmm. those students will be taking it early on and then we can we can follow them and, and do those kinds of comparisons. But I need to find a collaborator um, who's skilled at this because um, I know that I would not, I don't have the skills that I need to do that kind of work. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have actually like, I mean, it's exactly the right question, right? Oh, you're talking about all this bullshit. Now, like, now, like, prove it works or like well actually i can't i'm just bullshitting but but it's um at least i don't think i'm bullshitting but i don't have the, the level of quantitative evidence that i would really that i would really like and we need to figure out how to get that mm -hmm. thanks nancy thank you so uh so a question from uh, from the audience um uh Yariv uh, Tsati, a colleague of mine from the department, is asking, how would you design a social media platform to minimize the spread of bullshit? Fantastic question. Um, yeah, we talk about this a lot at the, uh, at the Center for the Informed Public. That, that, so actually, one of the things that, you know, fun things that came out of this class and, and you know, resulted in this sort of career direction change for me was um, we received a large grant a year ago from the Knight Foundation to set up a... a uh, organization called the Center for the Informed Public that is uh, set, you know, it's basically a group of faculty from all over campus from law and policy and, and engineering and computer science um, and, uh, and inf the information school and communications. Um, so it's, you know, drawing from all over um, to address exactly these kinds of issues. And uh, so, so that we, we do worry a lot about, about how would you do that? I mean, I think, um, it's really tricky, right? Because the 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 um, incentive to generate so I mean the you know the all the monetary incentives that are there are are to generate clicks, and so um, you know everything about the way these platforms are organized is to try to keep people on um, on the platform to keep them clicking to keep them engaged, um, and more or less with disregard for the quality of the information that they're receiving. So, um, you know, Facebook doesn't care whether you're learning anything, but they do care whether you stay on, on Facebook. And so the algorithm, and this is all being done algorithmically, right? I mean, so that, you know, like, you know, they're running these AB comparisons. They can be running, um, you know, dozens to hundreds of them at any given time to see what, you know, to see what algorithmic recommendations or even, you know, interface tweaks keep people on the site. Um, and in that sense, like social media platforms are the biggest bullshitters out there because they don't care about the quality of information. They're just trying to impress us enough to keep us clicking. And uh, so, so how do you break away? And, and, and that's, you know, that is, you know, to some extent their fiduciary duty to their shareholders and, and so on. That's, that's what they're trying to do. So how do you break away from that? I mean, I think somehow you've got to um, find a way to, um, you know, re-envision what the economic model is going to be to uh, support the existence of these platforms. Um, you know, I, 
you know, we sometimes we sometimes talk about, you know, well, maybe you should have, uh, you know, just like you've got uh, public broadcasting or something, you should have public social media. Uh, you know, even someone, even as someone who really uh, tends to be in the favor of government services, I've, you know, I've seen how badly governments can screw up anything. And if you, you know, in the United States, if you try to use the, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation's grant application platform or something like that, you quickly see uh, just how terrible a, a government uh, created uh, social media platform would be. They just wouldn't get that quite right. So, so it's tricky. I don't know. Um, so I don't know how to do that. I mean, there are little there, are, we, you know, we, we spend a lot more time thinking about tweaks on the margins because we talk a lot with Facebook and, and uh, Twitter and, and uh, others about this. So, um, you know, I think there are nudges that can help, right? There's a, the, you know, the recent Facebook nudge to uh, say, hey, you know, do you want to read the article before you share that? Um, can be can be useful. Um, I think you know, one of the things that is really dangerous is the uh, rapidity of exponential spread on these platforms, and that's something that a lot of the platforms have been trying to deal with. So, uh, you know, WhatsApp had uh, has uh, had particular problems with this. It's used a lot in the developing world, and uh, there you have people that are more recently coming online and are more susceptible even than than Americans to to um to bullshit and so you've had all these cases where you've had uh you know false rumors that get passed around about people kidnapping children or other things that then lead to a lot of gang kill you know sort of uh, mob killings and and this sort of thing and so one of the things that uh, they've tried to do to crack down on that is they've actually um you know added for biologists the equivalent of telomeres to uh, to posts in other words they uh, you know a post can only be shared five times and then it's dead um, so it's a telomere make is kind of a way of making sure that a cell can only replicate a fixed number of times and then it can't keep going. Um, and so that, so, you know, things like that to sort of limit the potential for exponential spread, uh, can be really, really useful. Um, yeah, I, but ultimately I think that as we, you know, if we're in a s situation where, um, I mean, again, I guess the other, the other piece of this, right, is just this sense of the, of the, um, I mean, all of this is tapping into our uh, natural desires as information foragers. So this is what we've evolved to do. We're just like animals optimally forage for, you know, finding the right sizes of nuts and make good decisions about that and so on. We do that for information and we, and, and we, we, we've drawn to seek information and you can think about anxiety as, you know, one of the main sources of anxiety is not only to, you know, prepare yourself for flight of flight, but it's to cause you to seek out more information. And we live in a world where, uh, where, um, where we are anxious, you know, especially during a COVID pandemic, but anytime, and that keeps us seeking information. And how do you keep someone seeking more information? Well, you make them more anxious and the algorithms figure this out. And so these algorithms have figured out more about us as information foragers than psychologists ever had, just because their sample sizes are in the billions and they can be running all of these simultaneous experiments and they don't have to deal with the uh, with, uh, IRB or anything like that. Um, and so they tap into and exploit these aspects of our psychology very, very effectively. And so unless we can somehow break the incentives for social media to do that, I think we're gonna be stuck in this cycle where, the so where social media is exploiting us instead of vice versa. That's not a good answer to your question because it doesn't have any solutions, but it's how I think about it. I believe we have time for like, Two brief questions. So Great. first one, first one from uh, our colleague at Hebrew University, Professor Karen Tenenbaum Weinblatt. So Karen is asking, what types of readings are you assigning in this course? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. So, um, so they're all online. You can take a look. Um, we try to. Uh, move quite, we try to cover a lot of ground. So of course we read, you know, so we read a little bit of uh, philosophy and, you know, uh, Harry Frankfurt and some of the responses to Frankfurt. Um, we read some, uh, you know, uh, uh, we read some basic work on, um, on sort of disinformation in class. Uh, one thing we've started doing the last few, uh, the last few couple of years is we read the, um, the, disinformation studies literature. So we added a section this year, a discussion section, and each week they read a paper from the, um, you know, sort of spot new, 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 new literature in the field of disinformation studies and, and, and look at that. Um, we have them read some basic, you know, stuff in, um, 
you know, sort of numerical thinking, quantitative thinking, a little bit about causality, case studies. So we have them read some papers that are, that they can then, that we then explore in the class. So it's really quite a uh, wide ranging um, uh, set of, of readings. And I'm always interested for suggestions for other things to read as well. So feel free to, you know, if I'm missing obvious things, which I almost certainly am, I'd love to hear about it. Thanks, Carl. So a final question uh, from uh, Dr. Sharon Ringel. So Sharon asks, what in your opinion could be the danger in calling bullshit? In other words, separating bullshit from non-bullshit could create a separation between high and low culture. I I is it possible that, that bullshit matters? Yeah, well, I mean, there are some good things that bullshit does. Um, you know, bullshit, of course, uh, is essential, uh, in, in, of a mild sort, is essential for... Uh, for you know, sort of greasing the wheels of social interactions, there are times when we tell white lies rather than insult someone to their face. Um, you know, I really liked your casserole or whatever. Um, I, but but I think I, 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 I'm not sure it will create a distinction between high and low culture because, or if it does, I I, I think high culture might fall on the wrong side of the divide. I mean, it's a uh, um, low culture often has a way of of uh, of being very direct about things and high culture often has a way of becoming uh, self-referential and full of bullshit. So uh, I don't know which way that would go if, if, if that did create a divide. Um, you know, I think what, you know, we don't want to create a world where um, uh, people can't express themselves. Right. Um, but I, you know, well, I, I mean, I think that, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's so different, right? I mean, just eat, culturally even is so different. I mean, in the United States, uh, you know, in a lot of the United States, it would be very, very rude to disagree with anybody over anything, about anything, right? At the dinner table or something like that. And, and, you know, my, you know, that's less of a problem in Israel, which I think is a very, very healthy thing. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I, th I, th I think that the, 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 danger around calling bullshit is that it could be used by people who are in positions of power to quiet those who are not. Um, but, uh, but, but I, uh, um, I don't, I, I haven't been so concerned with the dangers and maybe I should have been. So again, I'd be happy to take comments on that. Okay. So actually I, 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 I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take the last the, uh, the, the, the final uh, 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 question slot and, and ask oh, this. I know there's, a, I think there's a fashion, maybe it's a fad, maybe it's a real strategy in engineering of the biomimicry of, yeah. of, of, right, of inspiration from, from the animal kingdom, maybe Absolutely. the plant kingdom as well, when designing systems. So I'm wondering from your knowledge of biology, from your work with animals, is there any inspiration we can take from their systems when designing our information systems? I mean, I think there are, um, you know, the, the, there's a really interesting, um, there's, this, there's this really interesting parallel development of two fields um, in, in economics and in biology that both involve costly signals. And so um, in biology, it's, you know, uh, Amash Shahavi and the peacock's tail and, and, uh, and, and that whole story about the peacock's tail being a costly signal of ability, uh, of sort of, of quality, right? A peacock can show to a female peahen that, that he's in very good condition by having this big, beautiful tail because a peacock that was sick uh, or not strong couldn't make a tail like that and couldn't get away from predators with a tail like that. Um, the same, uh, and so it's this notion of costly signals. It's, it, it relates to some of the sort of skin in the game stuff, but it really has more to do with the idea that, uh, you know, uh, that there are different that there are some things that are sort of differentially costly they're cheap for some people to do and expensive for others and the, the same um, the same ideas have bec been very very influential in economics they're developed by Michael Spence uh, at almost exactly the same time as Shahavi developed the ideas in biology and uh, and so um, with with Spence uh, you know he was talking about why do people get an education and saying um, you know, I uh, came up with this model where the, what you learn is in college is actually useless to your future employer, but what it does do is it allows your future employer to more effectively screen between high productivity and low productivity employees because uh, the cost to a high productivity employee of getting a good college degree is is relatively low, whereas um, you know it's something that's hard for a low quality employee to to low productivity employee to fake. Um, Spence got a Nobel Prize for that, and I think the main difference was he wrote down an equation and Jahavi didn't. Um, 
the uh, um, so I think that you know in that whole area, and, and and this has just been applied to so many areas of economics now at this point. You know, uh, why why uh, why um, why uh, uh, stock um, companies, why companies issue stock dividends, and all of these kinds of things, right? So um, so I think that is one area where we've already seen a lot of sort of bio inspired or bio paralleling. Um, information design, um, but it's a great question and we should think more about that as we think about social media because I haven't thought about that directly with social media. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm not, I don't have any quick smart answers but I bet there are some. So thank you. Th thank you, thank you Carl so much. This has been really fascinating. I know because of the webinar format, not everybody can have the camera access and can clap, but uh, Nancy and Owen will sure join me. Well, and thank you very much. The people at home are going to uh, 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 join as well. This has been really, really uh, fascinating and thought-provoking and uh, a real treat at the end of this conference. So I, I want to thank you, Carl, for joining us in what is the like midpoint of your weekend on a Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, instead of eating bagels and cream cheese, you're here. Yeah talking to us about these fascinating topics, but thanks so much. And I thank want to say, and I want to thank uh, everybody that came to the conference, all the attendees and presenters and, uh, and, 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 and uh, people who helped organize this conference, grad students and, uh, and, 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 and everybody. And the hope that uh, 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 for all those in Israel, We'll have an opportunity next year, hopefully in December, to meet again and this time meet face to face. And, uh, and of course, uh, extend an invitation to you, Carl, if you ever come to Israel. We'd oh, love, love to that. have Thank you face to face in our departmental colloquium. It would be a real, real uh, 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 honor. So oh, that would be a real treat. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a real honor to speak to you all. And, and, uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. So feel free to reach out by email and tell me all the things that I got wrong. Cause I seriously like, I, I mean, I was talking on your turf, so please, please give it back. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, call me out on what I need to hear. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Take thank care you so everybody. Much, Carl, and thank you everybody. Uh, good night. Laila Tov, Litraot. All the best. Bye-bye.